Hello everyone, I am Zarek Zord Sentinel, and welcome back to Century of Economy! When we left off, conflict had finally begun in earnest between the Americans, French, and Spanish. Now, on to the action! Despite the closeness to some of the American privateer launches, gold ships continue to enter Voyanui Bay, seeking the minerals that can be found on the island. The volcano has threatened several times, but ultimately has not erupted. The Atlant attempts to ram a mast off of the York, but fails. Moving back along their line, the French do very little damage to the Americans. The presence of the Ghostwalker and Majestic will make combat difficult. Taking advantage of some treasures aboard, the Premier Republic beats a hasty retreat from the front lines, leaving a gap. That gap is filled by Limucure and La Province, each towing a flotilla. Unfortunately, the combined cannons cannot sink any of the opposing American ships, but the Oregon is set aflame. USS Amberflame loses a mass to a successful ram and is set aflame by the Conquerant. At the end of their turn, the French launch La Sirene with Captain, Helmsman, Gunner, and Oarsman. The Argonaut with Duncan Rousseau, Captain, Helmsman, Cannoneer, Musketeer, and Oarsman. La Corse with Capitaine Francois Moreau, Helmsman, Cannoneer, Musketeer, and Oarsman. Sabre with Philippe Tyzac, Gaston Le Bocher, Musketeer, Helmsman, and Oarsman. Genrevere, with Captain, Helmsman, Cannoneer, Musketeer, Gunner, and Oarsman. Le Petit Canon, with Captain, Helmsman, Gunner, and Oarsman. And Le Etoile Brillante, with Captain Louis Lefebvre, Helmsman, Musketeer, and Oarsman. Furious and saddened by the, at the capture of the Trinidad, the Spanish fight back, setting the Concorde aflame. Crossing the bow of the Concorde, Il Dutz captures a derelict American ship and eliminates another mast from the Concorde. Space suddenly opens up at the castle, as the Spanish mount a counterattack. The Kettering is their main focus, and has been reduced to one mast standing. The Spanish retake a tower of the castle, protecting themselves from potential fire. The raiding squadron gets underway, cutting through the shipping lanes to Kenohi Island in the process. Given an extra action, La Morte del Diablo dismasts both the Kettering and Concord. At the end of their turn, the Spanish launch at the Pathway Island. El Paso, with Captain, Helmsman, Cannoneer, and Oarsman. And El Martillo de Dios, with Captain, Cannoneer, and Oarsman, towing the Diablo flotilla. In her first shoot action, the Munin sinks La Belle Itole. Between the Longship and the Amber Flame, the Concurrent and Grand Vanquer are heavily damaged. Le Mercure loses a mass to American cannons. Moving around the Sargasso, the Gemstone dismasts both the Mercure and Concurrent. Sliding in with her first action, the Alexandre gets her cannons in range, but ultimately does no damage. Despite being on fire, the Overton dismasts the Grand Vanquer. Getting into position, the Virtuous Wind sinks the Concurrent. Sliding up next to her, the Nagling sinks the Vanquer. Getting into position with a powerful salvo, the Grand Temple sinks the Tour Eiffel. Le Mercure soon follows her flotilla to the deeps. Somehow getting around the Spanish ships, the Pawtucket takes a mast off of the Maldicion. Following the Pawtucket, the Paul Revere takes control of the Castle Tower. The York dismasts the Vengeance with a successful ram. Killing honors are given to the New Orleans. The Magnifique is set aflame by the USS Ironsides. Using her wind catcher keyword, the Ghostwalker turns about to point herself north. Succumbing to her fires, the Strife sinks. However, she doesn't sink for good as Eternal kicks in, returning her to the American home island. Recognizing that Lenoir will be a problem, the Venture and Saratoga attempt to sink and kill Lenoir, but only succeed in eliminating two masts from the Superb. A wider shot of the general combat area. At left, the Kettering is supported by the Hessen and Concordia. The derelict hulk of La Aguila is sunk, presumably by the Georgetown. Zooming into action, the Grand Path receives the cannon bonus from the Majestic and tears into the Soleil Royale, bringing her down to one mast standing. Given an extra action, the Grand Path sinks her. In the brilliant light, the Black Watch gets into position and opens fire on La Magnifique, eliminating two masts from the French warship. At the castle, the Americans attempt to engage the Muerte del Diablo at extreme close range, 
but failed to damage the ship. Getting into position, the Franklin finally sinks the Granada and screens for the Kettering, protecting her from cannon fire. Squeezing in under the castle, the Colossus lets loose with her cannons and brings the Vos de Dios down to just a fire mast. Following the Colossus, the Pequod eliminates another mast from Il Dus. With renewed effort, the Americans finally land a hit on Marta del Diablo, setting her aflame. In the background, Il Dus has been dismasted. Squeezing in around the Grand Path, the Constitution and Yankee eliminate two masts from La Charlemagne. Not forgetting about La Province, the Julius Caesar sights and eliminates a mast from the ship. With some help, the Caesar makes short work of the province. On the northern side of Voyanui, the Congress enters the rolling fog bank. Given an extra action, the Munion sails forward and sinks the discharges. At the end of their turn, the Americans launch the very last of their own launchable ships. Slippery Devil, Hee, Nene Nui, Lady Washington, Brandywine, Mongrel, and USS Plymouth Rock. The English bring home a majority of the gold fleet, netting themselves a nice profit. A wide shot of pirate waters, they have finally upgraded their colony to level 5, and have been steadily accumulating gold while conflict rages in the east. With word of the English trespass of Poseidon's eye, Davy Jones orders Smaug into English waters. The giant dragon sets down in the hidden cove and eliminates the Honoiki single mast. Sensing that conflict may be at hand, Shamshire directs the Phantom west to sail around the far side of Poseidon's eye. Meanwhile, Shalbala has touched down on the trading port the Cursed have constructed on the mineral section of Poseidon's eye. At the end of their turn, the Cursed launch! Nightmare, with Witch Queen Salem. Slipknot, Plague, with Igor McWarren, Captain, Helmsman, and Oarsman. Sea Devil, with Capitaine Salazar, the Fell, Helmsman, and Oarsman. And King Jones, with the Red Crew, Brine, Keith Atkinson, Sargasso Calhoun, and Oarsman. And with that, the High Gods of the Seas called down their judgment, and the game was called to an end. Factions counted up golden ships still afloat to determine the winners, with first place going to whichever faction has the most ships afloat, second place to whichever has the most gold, and then alternating for places 3 through 6. In 6th place, with 27 ships afloat, 1,866 gold to their name, and a fleet point total of 487 are... The English! The English played a very passive game focusing only on two or three islands for gold. They benefited greatly when their resource island produced a valuable resource, and suffered when it did not. Despite launching several capable capital ships and gunships, they never sought out conflict, instead choosing to be defensive and isolated. In fifth place, with 40 ships, 1,380 gold to their name, and a fleet point total of 583 are... The Pirates! Like the English, the pirates played very passively and sought to trade resources more than fight and engage in combat. Unlike the English, the pirates explored their part of the sea thoroughly, and had several islands to draw resources and gold from, but suffered from low value resources for most of the game. Despite their proximity to the castle, the pirates had little to no interest in the structure, but did display great interest in Poseidon's eye to the west. That interest was diminished somewhat by the cursed takeover of that island and the skirmish with the dragons. In fourth place, with 50 ships, 2,645 gold to their name, and a fleet point total of 921 are... The Cursed! With the English to their north, and the pirates to their southeast, the Cursed found themselves sandwiched between two potentially powerful factions, and chose not to engage either in combat except when necessary such as the skirmish at Poseidon's Eye, which the Cursed saw as their territory and property. The discovery of the sub-ocean was revolutionary for them, as it gave use to all of their various sea creatures. Several hundred gold was extracted from the sub-ocean by the various monsters and creatures, and fed the gold-starved Cursed. The sub-ocean also opened them up to the Americans, who the Cursed would wage a cold war of sorts with. They were not happy in the slightest that American submarines were able to get into the sub-ocean, which the curse saw the entirety of as belonging to them. 
Several discussions were held between Davy Jones and American representatives to negotiate a tense peace. That peace was tested with the heart of Davy Jones' incident. In the end, peace held out, but not before a brief skirmish that saw the Phantom cripple several American ships. In third place, with 67 ships, 1,635 gold to their name, and a fleet point total of 1,472 are... The French! The French had possibly the worst home island location of the game, within erupting distance of Voyanui, and only one island close at hand that could produce resources. Despite this, they got off to a decent start, quickly expanding their fleet and territory, constructing three trading ports, two forts, and one level 5 colony. Early on they discovered, or were discovered, by the Spanish, who proposed an alliance, based on their similar language. The French agreed, and slowly built up a war fleet to assist their Spanish allies should the need arise. Eventually, the need did arise with the Americans, who the French were growing tired of themselves. In second place, with 98 ships, 3,091 gold to their name, and a fleet point total of 2,148 are... The Spanish! In a similar situation as the French, the Spanish had both good and bad home island placement. Good in that they were able to easily reach several islands for resources and gold, but bad in that they were unable to find a large island to support large launches of ships. Once again, they found themselves near the lagoon and the high-value gold it contained, which helped boost their gold effort when resource values dropped. The discovery of the castle was the turning point for the Spanish, as they decreed that they would own and occupy all of the structure. The Americans had also discovered the castle, and at the same time began colonizing it, just before the Spanish did. This set off a chain reaction that culminated in the first real conflict of the game when the Americans fired on the Spanish and effectively kicked them out of the castle. The conflict against the Americans was brief, but saw heavy losses on the side of the Spanish. And in first place, with 150 ships, 924 gold, and a fleet point total of 2,913 are... The Americans! With a very good home island placement, and valuable resources from the get-go, the Americans quickly blossomed and became the largest fleet on the seas launching at least one ship every turn, since their third turn at the least. Putting together an effective gold fleet, the Americans raked in resources, gold, buried treasure chests, and eventually cargo crates. Expanding into the sub-ocean put them at odds with the Cursed, but no true conflict came of that animosity. The same cannot be said of their relationship with the Spanish. The Americans were among the first to find the castle, and were the first to claim a part of it. Their efforts to construct a colony in the castle were thwarted by the Spanish when they initiated a hostile takeover. Not willing to have an enemy launch point so close to their home island, the Americans fought back, first raising the Spanish-controlled colony, then seizing all of the castle for themselves. When the Spanish began taking it back tower by tower, the Americans realized they would need to engage the Spanish directly. After a fruitless meeting with the Spanish admirals and commanders, the Americans wiped out the Western Spanish squadron and inflicted heavy losses on the Spanish line at the castle. Despite their initial success, they were unable to penetrate into Spanish home waters, which was their initial goal. In addition, the French coming to the aid of the Spanish put a severe wrench in the works for the Americans. With that, the Americans are proclaimed the winners of Century of Economy 2021, quite a turnaround from their fourth place finish in 2020. As with every game, there were several things I enjoyed, and a few I did not. I quite enjoyed the added mechanics of the sub-ocean and castle, and I intend to bring both back for next year's game if possible. However, both were difficult to move ships around, with the large castle being in the middle of the map, and on the join between two tables. The addition of cargo crates will likely change how these games are played, and I may change how the crates function so that they cannot be so easily abused in the future. As I've said for the last few years, this could be the last time we play this game, at least on tables with the actual ships. Real life continues to move forward, and my brothers and I increasingly find our time limited to have these large games. That said, we do intend to give COEC another go in 2022, and have already chosen which factions we'll be controlling. If you want to see whatever it is I do next, make sure you're subscribed. If you liked what you saw, hit that like button. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.